welcome to FPTV. Welcome to FPTV new releases with myself, Andrew Sumner, and Forbidden Plants head book by Laura Dodd. How are you doing, Laura? Yeah, very well. Thank you very well. Good to see you. And this is one of our 12 Days of Halloween specials, and it's our absolute privilege to be joined by Paul Tremblay. How are you, Paul? All right. Yeah. I mean, wish I could be over. Uh, I wish I could be over in England. I was supposed to be there in April, and obviously things had to change. So. Yeah, I, I hear you, mate. I spend a lot of my time in the US, and it's been the same thing. I've been spending six months in my lounge rather than on, you know, traveling back and forth. <laughs> so, uh, I, and w- would particularly like to start uh, talking about your exquisite latest book, Survivor's Song which you can order from the links attached to this interview, by the way, guys. So there we have it. Exactly. That is exactly the one. I love it. Um, can you just give us a flavor of the novel, please, mate? Sure. So it sort of opens in the middle of a, of a, of a like a super rabies outbreak in Massachusetts. Um, and Natalie is, uh, she's in her early to mid thirties. She's eight plus months pregnant. And her and her husband are attacked by an infected man. Her husband gets killed and Natalie's bitten. And really the rest of the novel is told in real time, four to six hours of Natalie and her best friend, Dr. Romola Sherman, uh, who's originally from South Shields. So a little bit of <laughs> uh, English flavor. Um, yeah, it's four to six hours of them trying to get help, essentially. Uh, and it's, um, it's a, a very intimate read, actually, mate. So um, I think uh, Laura was telling me it was before. Yeah, I mean, that's what you found so impactful about it, wasn't it, Laura? Yeah, just just the having the kind of I suppose the two characters against against the world kind of element, and it just felt yeah, it just really resonates. I think so. Thank you. You know, I, going into it, when I first had the the what if that I can't say because it spoils the book, but I knew I didn't want to do like a expansive cast of thousands type of zombie adjacent <laughs> story not because those are bad but they've been done so many times like i didn't and i thought it'd be more interesting to really hone in on two characters and, and over a, a really short time frame too yes yeah yeah no definitely de- it definitely strikes um do you think there's anything obviously you wrote this way before <laughs> what's happening <laughs> now in, yes. in in hindsight um would there be anything you would change or Oh, it, it's funny. It's hard to, because I mean, I don't think I don't think I would write the book now, like if that makes sense, or at least I would have to wait like a bunch of years before I I, I could. Um, little things like I would change the oral thermometers to to forehead thermometers, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it sort of was sort of important for the book. Um, and I don't know. And some of the things that I don't want to say predicted what was happening in the U.S. I mean, if anything, I think I was too too. Uh, <laughs> too mild on some of the predictions about what some of the conspiracy theories would be and you know the lack of proper reaction government reaction would be <laughs> I, I mean the thing is uh you're not alone there right i think that, you know just about everybody we talk to about the current state of the world you know politically both here in the uk and you know mm-hmm. and there in the year and with you guys in the us you know we're uh, we're sort of blonde um you know what's the you know silver spoon you know, kind of privileged jackasses, you know, are, are running the countries into the ground. You know, it, it's very difficult to predict a couple of years ago that we, where we are now. So, you know, it would be almost superhuman if you'd seen any of the wilder aspects of what's going on at the moment. Yeah, although, I mean, I will admit, like, for a few books now, I've sort of been really sort of one of my uh, preoccupations as a writer has been, you know, the effect of misinformation, you know, particularly in, in the internet uh, media world. The effects that misinformation has on us. I mean, that's, I think that certainly comes up in uh, the cabinet, my prior novel, Cabinet at the End of the World, and it sort of, you know, happens again here in Survivor Song. So, I don't know. I mean, I think some of it, you know, you know, you can see sort of coming just in terms of, you know, I, and I don't know what the solution is. I don't know how do we, how we fix just the glut of misinformation that's out there, um, you know, and turning everything into a real life horror. This is becoming yeah. depressing. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Sorry, mate. That's my fault for taking the. Uh, I yeah. mean, we've actually segued. We were we were talking before, and we were going to get specifically into this point with you about coming at the end of the world and Swamp Song leaning heavily into politics. So we've uh, we've nicely just happened upon that that, that topic <laughs> organically. How can you avoid it in the world in which you're in? Yeah, no. no both those books, I, I sort of purposefully leaned into, you know, in particular the United States, what life has been like or what it feels like the anxieties of living 
in Trumplandia. <laughs> yes, <essentially>. wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, no, existential dread is dialed up to the max, you know, for me personally, I'm not, you know, just waking up in the morning is a strange thing in the world in which we're in now, right? And, you know, I mean, this week, even this week alone, I mean, I mean, you're talking about what would have been six months worth of news arcs a couple of years ago, and it's happened in five days. It just, it's like, what, what the fuck is going to happen next? You know, it's no. incredible. I, I, no, it know. is insane. Yeah, it's insane in every way. Yeah, right on. <laughs> Laura, mate, over to you. Yeah, so where else do you draw your inspirations from apart from what's happening in the real world today? <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I'm first, as a horror writer, I'm afraid of everything. So there's a wealth of <laughs> subjects for me to, to dig into for myself. Uh, though, I guess it, it's, uh, for my novels, I typically, uh, what I've been doing has been turning to sort of a particular horror trope and then seeing you know, what I would do with it. And, and so far it's been like, been trying to ground it in reality, right? Survivor Song is sort of an infected or zombie-ish novel. And I tried to make it as realistic as possible. And even, you know, the rabies virus that I use in the novel is real rabies. You know, I just, I made it a little extra vir virulent. I can't say, I should stop trying to say virulent. But, <laughs> I, can't. but uh, I moved up the timeline of infection for rabies essentially. But otherwise, like, you know, the people being a little bit extra bitey, I guess, but in terms of, you know, how it works, you know, um, you know, how it travels through the body, that, that's all real rabies, which is just this, you know, terrifying illness. Um, you know, in Cabin at the End of the World was, you know, sort of my riff on a home invasion story, a head full of ghosts, obviously was, a, you know, a possession thing. So for the bigger works, I kind of think, or I've been drawn to thinking about, okay, what sort of trope can I mess around with mm -hmm. next? Yeah. <laughs> And am I right in thinking, mate, that um, your background uh, was in basketball coaching and you got a degree in mathematics? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So how, how, do you, how do you have that background and get to the place that you're at now? I'm absolutely fascinated with it because actually I'm related to a bunch of people who've got maths degrees. I do not. I, I used to be a journalist. I've got an English degree. But oh. most of the people I know with maths degrees are kind of brilliant. But what they aren't is natural writers. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> You're a phenomenal writer. So I, I just, I'm fascinated how that all came about and, you know, how it works in your head. Yeah, I guess, so I, I'm sort of like a half-assed mathematician then. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say um, that because you yeah, might yeah. be a brilliant mathematician. I didn't no, want to. It's okay, no, I, I'll yeah. really admit that. No, I mean, it's sort of weird to, like, how I got to where I am. I mean, I, I did a, I've done a lot of, like, falling into things and, even though I'm six four, I didn't. I was lucky <laughs> yeah. not to fall on my face and land on my feet. Like even my getting into grad school, uh, I got into graduate school. I'd sent an application to the University of Vermont. Never heard from them. And then over the summer, they're like, "Hey, we're moving uh, the dean's office around, and we found your application under his desk. Would you like to be considered for admittance?" Sure. And then three weeks later, I was at the school. Um, so I don't know. I mean, um, what ended up happening was when I went to graduate school which sounds weird because I'm going for, for math. That's where I fell in love with reading for pleasure. Is that right before I went, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, Lisa, bought me Stephen King's The Stand. Um, and I loved it. And it, when I was, you know, so we did the long distance relationship thing for two years. And so when I was up there really struggling by this, to get this math degree by the skin of my teeth. I mean, I was, I would not consider myself a brilliant mathematician. Um, I was, you know, I read all the Stephen King and, you know, from him, I discovered Peter Straub and Shirley Jackson and Clive Barker and, so at the end of, you know, when I, when I had my master's and I started my first high school math teaching job, um, I had this weird itch to try writing a story. Um, so like when I first started teaching is when I first started writing. So I really don't know one without the other. And it's, I don't know. Uh, I mean, basketball, it, at my school, it's a really small school. So they expect the faculty to coach. Yeah. Okay. I like basketball. So yeah. I said, sure, I'll coach it. So. <laughs> yeah, so some of that has sort of happened. <laughs> I, I, I think it's interesting you mentioned the stand because time and time again, it seems to me that seems particularly to be one of those key gateway novels for people to get into horror. You know, and like people, are, you know, I was at college, I read the stand, and then I just had to get into King, and then getting into King put me into everybody else. You know, and uh, I, I hear that I hear that story a lot, but is it? Um, there's so much in that novel, I guess. You know, to yeah, it's so no, I mean, I think, written. sure, obviously, I mean, there's the, the horror aspect of it, but, you know, what I remember, because I haven't reread it in a long time, all these years later, is, like, the characters, and 
you know, trash can man and stuff like that. I mean, those are the things that I think why Stephen King still resonates is, you know, he's writing about, you know, he's not writing about sort of distant Victorian characters. Like for me, that was my discovery. It's like, oh, you know, my dad worked in a factory and my mom was a bank teller. It's like, this guy is writing about, you know, my parents and the people that they knew and worked with and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that kind of makes sense. Actually, now that we're talking about Stephen King, I know that Laura, you had a question that related to Stephen King. Yes, yeah. So I was going to um, ask about your career highlights, apart from <laughs> being able to scare Stephen King. Uh, <laughs> what other um, career highlights have you had so far? Oh man, I mean that's a that's a big one. Um, yeah. Honestly, yeah. just writing just writing a head full of ghosts to me was a huge deal because I had written and published in two thousand nine and in 2010 two like I would call I like to call them weird boiled although Lydia my publicist and friend doesn't allow me to call them weird boiled <laughs> <laughs> I hope she watches and hears this um so I wrote these two crime novels and they didn't sell well at all and it really put me in a funk and it took me two years just to you know a few years more than two to get over sort of the sting to the ego you know and I was like bitter and jealous and you know it took me a while to figure out that you know that that doesn't help your writing if anything it hurts it uh, so just the very fact that I was able to be open to the idea of a head full of ghosts and actually write it and, you know, selling it was a hurdle because my previous sales record was bad. So a bunch of editors liked it initially and backed out because their sales teams at their publishers said, eh, you know, but it only takes one, you know, luckily, you know, I just needed, you know, uh, William Morrow and in, in the UK, obviously Titan books to take a chance on me. So to me, just having that happen, it was, it was a big career highlight. My other career highlight, which is sort of funny, is that I'm a frustrated musician at heart. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, I got my start writing and reading. I was also trying to play guitar. And honestly, if I could have a time machine and change things, I would still choose to be a punk metal <laughs> guitar hero kind of person. But I'm a better writer than musician, unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> anyway, I've been able to successfully, I playfully say stalk <laughs> or become friendly with like a bunch of my favorite musicians that I really admire because so many of them are readers and, you know, I've sent them books and, um, you know, I've gotten to go to shows and, um, you know, one of my, I guess, more recent current favorite bands, uh, uh, sort of a punk post-punk band in the UK called Future of the Left and McCluskey, Andy Falcus is the lead singer. And he and I have, because I, um, I quoted from uh, Future of the Left lyric and a head full of ghosts. So that's how I, that's how I, that's how I ensnared Andy. <laughs> I, love um, I don't know. To me, I mean, that's just been the fun part. To, like, these musicians are like, oh, you, you writers are so much cooler. I'm like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, th yeah. there is undoubtedly, uh, you're talking about indexing again. I mean, uh, you know, horror, horror and uh, I used to be a music journalist for a long time. Hor horror and, 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 and uh, rock music massively indexed. Mm. So, I mean, somebody we interviewed actually, for, it was 40, it was Forbidden Planets, 42nd anniversary last month and one of the people we interviewed was Alice Cooper right and he is a big big it's not really a surprise but he's a massive horror reader you know so he's he's a huge fan so uh I think I've, I'm particularly impressed with your punk connections over and that's uh that's 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 a, I suspect you would have been the world's tallest like punk guitarist had because often those guys are kind of Punk musicians are often built like Thunderbirds puppets, you know. I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're little fellows with big heads, you know. So uh, that's that's not you, you know. You're much more strapping than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, I guess the tallest Paige Hamilton of the band Helmet, American band yeah. Helmet. Right. Oh. Really yeah, yeah. yeah. Pa Paige is close to my height. He's like six foot yeah. three. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you, he's a, he's a lovely guy, by the way. <laughs> Like, oh, man, he's I, one of my I, another I, oh. one of my other successful uh that's that's so <laughs> cool man. Uh, that, 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 yeah that so, is very 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 cool because i was like hugely into helmet when i was at high school i was like total rock yeah. grunge kid oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> so laura's a massive fan of your work mate so you're super blowing a mind in these yeah, I'm just, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can't can't deal <laughs> So uh, I'm a head full of ghosts. You've got that in development with Team Downey right now, right? Speaking of very cool people to be connected to. Yeah, yeah. They're, so they're one, of the, one half of the production team. The other production team is called Allegiance Theatre. Uh, and it's been a long road. Hopefully it goes all the way to the end because they've had it since May of 2015. <laughs> and we've come close a couple times and, uh, you know, really close. And then, you know, there are much bigger problems in the world with COVID. You know, if, if COVID hadn't happened, it would have in the summer like almost in all likelihood so uh you know fingers crossed 
you know, for everybody, hopefully things can, you know, get much better in 2021 in every way yeah. possible. Yeah, no, fingers you crossed. Know, and is that a similar story for, because Film Nation have got Cabin at the End of the World, haven't they? Is, is that yes. a similar deal? Uh, yeah, so I haven't, they've had it for a less amount of time. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on with that, to be honest. Um, because we've been so close with a head full of ghosts, they've been in more contact with me recently. Uh, I have no contractual say on anything, so which is probably fine yeah. <laughs> for the moment. You know, cause, you know as, as much as we writers don't like to think that we're, we're precious when it comes to adaptations, we, we all are, <laughs> I'm sure. Of course, I, I, and I imagine, you know, kind of, a, if you look lucky enough, to go through that journey and be very satisfied with what you get at the end, which some people are, you know, but you never know if you're going to be in that camp, do you, until you get to that point. Right. So, you know, I, I understand it's quite a fraught process, but I can't imagine there's much, much better than if you're pleased with the adaptation you get at the end of it. That must be a pretty amazing thing. Yeah, so, I hopefully, hopefully I get to feel it. a potential future to look forward to, right? <laughs> so am, am I right in thinking that you're a board of directors for the Shirley Jackson Award? Uh, yes. I, uh, well, I would say I have been. I actually just left the board this year, essentially just to take a break. Uh, I'm still like, I'm one of the founders of the award. There was five of us who founded it. So, you know, it's very near and dear to my heart. And the idea is that we want to start rotating people off. So we're not, not only one, we're not stuck on the board forever because it is a lot of work, but also we want to bring in other people, other voices as well. So they haven't announced, we, we brought in two new board members. They haven't announced it publicly yet, but I would imagine um, that that's going to happen shortly. But uh, no, I, I love that award, near and dear to it. Uh, absolutely. And um, something that, that uh, Laura was talking to me about before is, uh, is what you're actually looking for in other horror novels as part of that process. Is that something you could talk us through? Yeah, well, so like when we first, when we first started it, the founders were the jurors. So, I mean, I think if I had any sort of agenda, my agenda was that, especially when we started this in what, like 2008, I think it was, 2007? that especially then a lot of what was being a lot of what was horror was not, was being that was being published was not being published as horror if that makes sense or it wasn't being marketed as horror you know so my personal agenda was no horror is actually doing quite well there's a lot of things being published that that to me falls in the horror genre but it's just it doesn't say horror on the spine um you know because i kind of think shirley jackson sort of fits in that spot right i mean just as her work is so, it's so hard to pin down. It's so funny. It's so smart. And also it can be so terrifying as well. And, you know, not enough people talk about the humor of her work. Um, so yeah, it was just the idea of just trying to promote, like promote the idea that, you know, horror is and can be this, you know, wide diverse genre in, in, in all the ways that you can think of the word diverse. Yeah, it's qu quite an interesting point because I know obviously there are some authors that will use different names to write horror. So Shauna Maguire writes horror under Mira Grant and, you know, whether it's a question of, I don't know, giving it some kind of credibility in a way or, I, yeah, it's, it's just interesting how horror um, is perceived and yeah. how quite often, I know I worked at Waterstones for many years and quite often obviously publishers will look to make, almost sell it as not a horror book. So sure. it will get into bookshops rather than, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's still, I think it's still, I think it's getting better. I mean, I think horror is being taken more seriously, you know, if that's what better means, but you know, there's still, I mean, even in the US, I think my publisher has leaned hard on trying to market the last two books as, thrillery like they've been trying to get, you know get into the thrillery side of things I guess but I mean but they never tell me like this is what you have to write like I, I write it it's like your job to sell it I really honestly don't care what you call it you know I, I'm happy to worry about or let other people worry about the, you know the marketing or selling side of things um, but you know I've, I've I've been to you know some literary mainstream festivals and it's kind of funny when you meet some other writers and they ask you what you do. Like I do pause for a second. I'm like, Oh, what am I going to tell them? <laughs> you know, if I tell them oh, I write horror, they're like, Oh, I can't read that stuff. And I'm supposed to be playing and say, yeah, why would you? Or like most of me is like, why not? Like as much as people say, Oh, I don't like horror. It's like, I don't understand you. Like, I don't understand how horror can't be a part of your life. I don't understand how you can't see that horror when done well to me it just seems like so honest it can get at like the really difficult questions of art and i don't know interesting in both honest and transgressive ways so 
anyway. Mm. Oh, that's very interesting. What, what are you, what are you um, what are you working on at the moment, Paul? Yeah, so I uh, I signed a new deal with my publisher in the U.S., William Morrow. So uh, I have until May. <laughs> so I've, uh, I started a new novel called The Paul Bearers Club, um, and I can't I can't say too much about it. Uh, I love the than, title though. I really love the title. It's great. This might be the first title that they're not going to try to change. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so it, so it's definitely a departure, I think, from the last two, like the, you know, Cabin and, and Survivor Song are so compressed time-wise, and your know, shorter novels. I think this book is going to be a little bit more take its time a little bit more, be a little bit more expansive in some ways, and you know, certainly time-wise, it's going to start in 1988 and, and come up maybe close to 2020, but not quite into 2020. At least I don't think. Um, and it's being written as a faux memoir. Uh, of a sort of semi-ridiculous character who is sort of really me, <laughs> but like an alternate <laughs> alternate reality me. Um, and there's another character who's at the end of every chapter sort of comments on on the on the memoir as to hey maybe this isn't true and sort of tells her side of the story somewhat. Um, so you know playing around a little, going back to playing playing around a little bit with what's true or not, some ambiguity, etc. With a Paul Bearers Club involved. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I actually can't wait to read that, mate. Um, we're, 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 we're like running full warp speed into the end of our time together. So, Laura, I know you've got one more key question to ask. Yes. So we've been asking <laughs> all of the authors taking part in the 12 days of Halloween, what scares them the most? And you can either be humorous or, or serious, entirely up to you, but um, what scares you the most? Oh, uh, I, I, I won't be a bummer. I mean, besides saying the world that scares me the most, but man, I mean, I have to admit, like the dark still gets me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't, I won't walk through a dark house, especially if I'm home by myself. You know, if I wake up in the middle of the night um, and have had a bad dream, it's it's hard going back to sleep, you know, even with, with Lisa there with me. <laughs> so in many ways, I'm still like the kid that I was sleeping with stuffed animals arranged around my head. I don't do the stuffed animals thing anymore. That's what I did as a kid. I promise, no stuffed animals. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean that the confluence of a dark, empty house and stuffed animals is pretty terrifying, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I think that's it. I think it's a great answer. Um, there's there's a oh man, there's a trade show right that happens in Dallas at a place called the World Trade Center. It's not you know it's it, it's right. a, and it, what it is. It's basically a fake shopping mall right? It's actually where they film the future city sequences in Logan's Run, if you've ever seen that. Oh, okay. So it's one of these 70s expressions of what the future, future is going to be like. And it's a shopping mall, but it's actually all kind of like, um, you know, shop windows for various chains. And so like, it's the empty ghost of a shopping mall in effect. Yeah. And I was at a trade show once there and was having a problem with the booth and got stuck there as they began to shut it down and shut all the lights down. So I was on the 11th floor inside an empty shopping mall with the lights going out. And that might be the single most terrifying moment of my adult life where I suddenly began to really, really panic and think, I've got to get out of here, you know what I mean? So I feel that completely, yeah. you, know, you know, even your own home in darkness can be rendered into a terrifying place, right? Yeah, that sounds terrifying. No, yeah. uh, I would have been like in a ball on the ground. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I wouldn't have wished it on anyone. <laughs> and, and, and on that a primal fear-based note, um, this has been 12 Days of Halloween with FBTV New Releases. And we've been privileged uh, to speak to Paul Tremblay about his amazing novel, Survivor Song, which you can buy from the links attached to this video. Thanks very much for making the time to speak to us, mate. We really appreciate yeah. it. Oh, please. My pleasure, Andrew and Laura. Thank you. Yeah. And you take care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Okay. All right. All the best. Take care, mate. Bye. Enjoy your Saturday night. <laughs>